I invite you to take your Bible in hand and turn to Genesis chapter 21. And I'll invite Terry to come and read our passage this morning. The passage again is Genesis 21, verse 22 to 34. Genesis 21, 22 to 34. The Treaty at Beersheba. At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his forces, said to Abraham, God is with you in everything you do. Now swear to me here before God that you will not deal falsely with me or my children or my descendants. Show to me, and the country where you are living, as an alien, the same kindness I have shown to you. Abraham said, I swear it. Then Abraham complained to Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized. But Abimelech said, I don't know who has done this. You did not tell me, and I heard about it only today. So Abraham brought sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a treaty. Abraham set apart seven ewe lambs from the flock. And Abimelech asked Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven lamb, ewe lambs you have set apart by themselves? He replied, Accept these seven lambs from my hand as a witness that I dug this well. So that place was called Beersheba, because the two men swore an oath there. After the treaty had been made at Beersheba, Abimelech and Phicol, the, the, the commander of his forces, returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called upon the name of the Lord, the eternal God, and Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. Thank you, Terry, for reading God's word for us this morning. Let's pray and invite the Lord to speak to us this morning. Lord God, we thank you so much for these words. The story of Abraham and how it reminds us of another name of yours, Lord God, Al Olam. Lord, may you speak to us, draw us closer to you, we ask you, Lord God, to open our eyes to see you, open our ears to hear from you, and give us the courage to put in practice what you teach us this morning. May we again, Lord God, be in awe of you and your name. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. One of the biggest well-known brands of boxing gloves is Everlast. Have you ever heard that name before, Everlast Boxing Gloves? I would have never gotten to boxing at all, but I once in a while would watch one or two boxing matches in my teen years, um, mainly because some of the youth that I hung around with, some of them were into boxing matches and, and watching that kind of stuff, and so I watched it a couple of times. And you would notice most of the boxers usually would actually use Everlast Boxing Gloves. As I prepared for this sermon this morning, I, the name of God relates to this term everlast, as we'll see in a moment. So I thought, well, there's these boxing gloves called everlast, and so let's find out how long they last for. So I went to the website to find out what do they claim, how long would boxing, these boxing gloves last? On their website, it says they'll last up to three years. Three years. Apparently, they don't live up to their name Everlast. <laughs> but that's like everything material, right? Nothing is everlasting. Only God is everlasting. Because of God, we can be everlasting, not in the sense that we always existed, but we have an eternity if we come to faith in Jesus Christ. This morning, as we look at our passage this morning, is a story of Abraham 
and a man who lived nearby named Abimelech. He was a pretty big man, not necessarily physically, but so I don't know how big he was physically, but he had a large army, he had a large following, he had a lot of people who worked for him. And he recognized something about Abraham's God, that Abraham's God had blessed Abraham. So he goes to Abraham and, and tells him, I've, I've dealt kindly with you. Would you make a promise with me that you always deal kindly with me and the generations after me? As we see in this passage, Abraham was only happy to do that, except he said, there's still this issue, though. Some of your servants took my well away. They stole my well. And as you, we read, as Terry read, we heard that Abimelech said, I didn't know about this situation until just now. So, but I did promise to you now, though, that this well is yours. I recognize that you dug it. It's yours. But Abraham still goes further. He goes the extra mile. Sheep, take them as a marker, as payment to show that this well is mine. And Abimelech took it. Then towards the end of this passage here, we read these words. Abraham planted Tamar's tree in Beersheba, and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. We don't know necessarily the words that Abraham said when he spoke to God there, but I'm sure it must have been words of praise and say, Lord God, thank you that you have resolved this issue of this well. This well that I needed for my family and for my sheep, as Beersheba was a place that Abraham and his family were living at the time. But notice he says, it says he prayed to the everlasting God. The Hebrew words here is El Olam. This is yet another name of God, another name that reveals the character of who God is. God everlasting. It's a name of God that we need to be reminded of because of how great, how awesome God is, that he is everlasting there's one thing for us to look at this morning, and a few subpoints to this in this regard, that God is the everlasting God. God is the everlasting God, El Olam. When we look at this passage, again, mention the Hebrew words being El Olam. It's two words, El, which is the name for God, a word for God, and then Olam, which is the word everlasting. Now, it's important to understand what the word olam means. Yes, it's been translated in the English Standard Version and some other translations as being everlasting. But if we look at the Hebrew word, it's, this is actually what it means. It means forever. It means perpetual. It means old or ancient. This word is used 437 times throughout the Old Testament. It's a lot of times, isn't it? But this is the only time in Scripture, in the Old Testament, that we see that Olam is used with El. God everlasting. Now, there's been some other incarnations of this name of God, El Olam. Olam has also been used to mean as everlasting to everlasting. And this always refers to God and or His time. Meaning that God is forever. It also has been used as forever and ever in the Old Testament. It also has referred to an eternal home, an everlasting home, an eternity as beyond time. And all that relates to God still. So God is El Olam, God everlasting, from everlasting to everlasting, forever and ever, a God without end. There's a worship song that I, I love to listen to by a, a worship artist named Lincoln Brewster. And the song is called Everlasting God. And every time I hear the name Everlasting God, that song always plays in my mind. And unfortunately, I don't have it for you this morning. But I encourage you to maybe check it out on YouTube later. The name of the song again is Everlasting God by Lincoln Brewster. And this again speaks of how God is so great and awesome because he is a God without end. So how do we understand that God is a God without end? Well, here's four subpoints to that. First, 
The everlasting God is the creator of time. He is the creator of time. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When did God create the heavens and the earth? In the beginning, right. This is somewhat hard for us to fathom, isn't it? I know sometimes when I think about this, how is this possible that God existed before time? It's even kind of hard to even speak to that because we often have to use a, a reference to time saying before. It's really hard for us to fathom, isn't it? That God existed before time. That's really hard to fathom, isn't it? But again, Genesis 1 went in the beginning, the very start of all of the material world and all of life. God was before all of that. After all, again, he is the one who created that. He is the one who created time. Some people struggle with that a lot of times too when they talk about, well, how old is the universe? And some say, well, it looks like it's millions and millions, billions and billions of years old. But don't they recognize though that since God says in Genesis 1 that he spoke the universe in existence, that he could create things as they were, as if they were in motion already so that we can look up at the sky again or a creation say, wow, God, how amazing you are that you could create all of this just by speaking into existence. And just for that one moment that I can look in the sky, I could see the light from those stars. Or in that moment, I'm in the field and looking at the field of what you've created. God is the creator of time and all things. This shows, again, that God is an everlasting God because he created time. Next, then, the everlasting God is not confined to time. This is another one of those hard things to comprehend, isn't it, for us as humans? God created time, but yet he's not confined to it. He's outside of time. Second Peter 3 Verse 8 says this, But do not overlook this one fact. So Peter has given us a fact here. This isn't speculation. This isn't myth. This isn't theory. This is fact. That with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. This speaks of God not being confined to time, that God is beyond time. So to him, all time is the same. It doesn't matter to him. He knows and created time because we're material beings right now. We had to be confined to time. It's, it's kind of funny watching shows sometimes that talk about, that use time machines, right? And there's some conspiracy theories of that. Oh, I remember seeing one picture of a conspiracy theory of someone who from hundreds of years ago was in the middle of this picture holding a cell phone. Well, we know there's Photoshop. <laughs> we're confined to time. God created us in time. There'll be a time that we're not confined to time anymore, but not yet. That's not until Christ returns to take us home to heaven. But right now we're confined to time. God is not though, because again, he created time. That's why a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day to him because he's not confined to time. Again, it shows how awesome God is, right? How powerful he is. That he could see all the time, all at the same time. We, we can't do that, can we? It's hard to perceive that, right? We like to say sometimes, I plan to go shopping tomorrow to get groceries, to do this and to do that. But we don't know if, we're, if time is going to be tomorrow still. Sure, it's, it's good for us to plan for the future still. God's word tells us to keep on going as until he returns. Don't sell your things and sit on the rooftop till he comes. Be busy about his work. Go about life still as normal, but prepare for the day when he returns. So the everlasting God, that's why he's everlasting, because he's not confined to time and because he created time. This then also speaks to how the everlasting God had no beginning. And here's another one of those things that's hard to comprehend for us, right? We know that since the beginning of time and beginning of all things, everything had a beginning. Everything material had a beginning. I guess that's why God's word tells us that God tells us himself that he is spirit and not material things. Again, hard for us to comprehend, but that's the truth. This speaks again to how God has no 
beginning. John 1 verse 2 and 3 says this, He was in the beginning with God, and that's referring to Jesus. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So God, that including the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, created all things. That again speaks to how God had no beginning because he started the beginning of all things. Then Revelations 22 verse 13 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God is the one who created all things. He is the one who will bring all things to end. Even the angels, they had a beginning. God created them too. And then all the material world God created. God's word tells us too, there's going to be an end to this physical world someday. Something that for non-believers is definitely a scary thing, but for us as Christians, I can't wait for that day. When I hear of some of the prophecies and things that will happen, could they be fear, kind of feared, cause us to fear as Christians sometimes? Yes, that sometimes can happen. Remember watching the old movie, Image of the Beast. Anyone remember that movie back in the 80s, I think it was? Many of us saw it. It's about end times theology and kind of tries to portray what it might look like when Christ returns or, or the events leading up to Christ's return and kind of a scary movie. But for us as Christians, actually the end of time is not a scary thing because no Christ is taking us home to heaven then. So when I hear things of what's going on in the world, yes, sometimes there's fear with that. But when I remember that this is all signs that Christ is returning soon, it reminds me again that God is without end. God will bring all things to an end physically so that we can be with him in heaven forever. So the everlasting God is without beginning and he is without end. And the last part of this is the everlasting God cannot die. Makes sense, doesn't it? If he's everlasting, if he's all-powerful, he can't die then. Here's several verses on that very fact too. Luke 1 verse 32 to 33 says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over his house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. In that last verse 33 again, And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Not just one generation, not just two generations, forever, beyond time. Romans 16, verse 26 to 27, speaks of that very thing too. But has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God our Father, to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, in these words here, according to the command of the eternal God, the God who has no end, he cannot die because he is eternal. Even use this logic too, that since we know that God is all powerful, there's nothing that he can't do. He knows all things. That means that God also knew when Satan was going to rebel against him. He knows when each person or angel was going to rebel against him. So truly, God is immortal because he knows all things. So he knows how to undo all things. God cannot die. And then 1 Timothy 1 verse 17, to the king of the ages, immortal. What does the word immortal mean? No end. Can't die, lives forever. That's right. Yeah, yeah, no, we're not talking about Marvel characters. <laughs> it's a fictitious character, right? Real people, though, do die. We can know in Scripture there's only two people who've never died. That's Elijah and Enoch, right? Because Elijah was taken up in a chariot. And then in Genesis it talks about Enoch, how he walked with God and then he was no more. We interpret that to mean that he didn't die, but God took him up to heaven. But even with those two, 
their physical body is ended. But God is immortal. Again, 1 Timothy 1.17, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. There's those words again, but they're in the New Testament. Forever and ever. It's kind of neat seeing how the words were used in ancient times. In the New Testament, in, in Greek, and also in Hebrew in the Old Testament, how sometimes we didn't have a word to describe that God is forever. So we use terms like forever and ever. The everlasting God. What I didn't share with you before, though, about this word olam is that it doesn't necessarily mean no end, but also speaks to ancient time before for there being no beginning. We have talked about that this, this morning, that God is a God who had no beginning and he has no end. He is not confined to time, he has created time, and he cannot die. This again reminds us how great God is, how awesome he is. He is El Olam, the everlasting God. This name is significant for us to remember because, again, it shows us how powerful and how awesome God is, but also shows how much he loves and cares for us, that the God who had no beginning and no end would think to create each one of us for relationship with him. To me, that points again to how great a God he is. There is no God that man has made up of their own image or some demon that people worship that is like that. That doesn't show love, whether it be fictitious or a demon. Only God shows that kind of love. So the foresight to create us, even knowing the sins that we commit, knowing whether we would come to faith in him or not, but it would still create us. What a great God he is. There are three huge gates that lead into the cathedral in Milan. And over each gate, there's a phrase on it. Over one gate, there is the inscription. And it says this, the things that please are temporary. Over a second gate, there's this inscription above that door. The things that disturb us are temporary. Then over the central gate, these words are inscribed. Eternal are the important ones. Eternal are the important ones. Points us back again to God. God is the internal. So all things must be focused on him because that's what's important. God is eternal. All these things in this world are going to fade away someday. All material things will be destroyed. But God is eternal. And our relationship with him can be eternal. That's why, again, God is all-powerful. He is the eternal God. Because he can offer us eternal life. He's the only one who can do it. He's the only one who can come and die on the cross for our sins. He's the only one who could pay the penalty for our sins, and then offer us eternal life. If God wasn't eternal, he couldn't offer us eternal life because there's a home in heaven someday where God resides for eternity. We too can have eternal life through him. I'll encourage us to two points of action this morning. First is this. Be in awe of God. When you look at the night sky, you see the stars that we talked about earlier. Stand in awe of God of how he could create all of that. When you stand out in the field, whether it be a hay field or a grass field, or maybe it's looking over a lake or an ocean, standing there and being in awe of God that he could create such beauty. When you sit down at the dinner table, lunch table or breakfast table. We sit down to eat. Think about how awesome God is that he would provide that food for you. 
the God, the eternal God, would think of you to provide for that need. When you look at your home, when you walk in, that you would have a home, shelter over your head. When you think about the relationships and friends and family you have, even those tough ones sometimes, give thanks to God because he has a God of relationship. The eternal God wants a relationship with you. And he has put people in your path to have a relationship with you too. That doesn't mean we're going to have, it's always going to be easy in relationships. No. There'll be hard times sometimes. But we know that we have those relationships because God has given them because he shows his love to us. There's a warning for us this morning, though. If you do not heed these words, you will not understand how great God is because he created and he controls time. However, if you do heed these words, there's the blessing for you. You'll be in the greater awe of God, which will lead to a greater intimacy with him. If you go through the Psalms and you read a lot of the Psalms, you'll see time and time again how David and other authors in Psalms speak of how awesome God is because they recognize that God is El Olam, the everlasting God. Do you want to know this God who created and controls time and all things? Do you want to draw closer to him in relationship with him? Then seek to know El Olam, the everlasting God. Let us pray. El Olam, we thank you so much that even though you had the foresight of all things before you created them, you still chose to create this universe and all of life. You still chose to create us for the purpose of relationship with you. You knew that we would disappoint you. You, you knew that we would sin and fall short of your glory. You would know who would reject you and who would receive your gifts of salvation. And yet still, Lord God, you chose to create every single one of us. Truly, this speaks of how great you are, Lord God. Al-Olam, you are beyond time. Lord God, I'm humbled when I think of this. That in the ways I would sin before I came to faith in you, and even the times I would sin after that, you would still choose to create me. What amazing God you are. Truly, you are the God to be praised above all other things. Lord, forgive us in those times when we focus on other things. And Lord, we know that we have to do our jobs. We have the things of life that we need to do while we're living this life. There are duties and roles and responsibilities you've given us. But yet, Lord God, forgive us in those times when we don't have our eyes focused on you with those things too. Lord, you are beyond time, but yet, Lord, you want time with us. So, Lord, may we take the time to spend with you, to deepen our relationship with you through studying your word, reading it, studying it, meditating upon it, and applying it to our lives. Also taking the time to talk to you in prayer and listening to you in prayer. Lord God, may we draw ever closer to you because, Lord, you so does. How could that be? Al Olam, the everlasting God, that you would want a relationship with us. God, thank you. Truly, you're wonderful and great. For these things we're praying in the name, Lord Jesus. Amen.